Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney here, and I have the honor of having Mr. Miss, Miss, excuse me, Miss, God, I keep doing that, Mandy McAllister. How are you doing? Oh, hi. Yeah, I was just living the dream, Austin. Pumped to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. So before we get started, I want to thank uh, dreamchasers.com for sponsoring the podcast. If you haven't checked it out, make sure you go over and get it. But Guys, there's no telling where this interview is going to go. We met each other on the phone and and we're, we became besties right away. So, you know, the good news is, is I don't know a ton about you. So um, I'll let you kind of get your story started where you want to and we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. I um, I grew up on a farm in a town of like 800 people. And the a cool gift that I got from my parents was asking the question, why not me? You know, like Mm -hmm. I played volleyball and my, you know, gosh, to play division one volleyball was this unrealizable idea, uh, as so many people told me. Right. But my, you know, mom said, you know, they're going to need volleyball players on that team. So why not you? So it's, it was, I mean, I guess I've always, the, the mindset piece of life has always been a big, uh, subset of how I construct my life. See what I did there? Yeah, you did. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> plugs. Uh, so I, you know, I've been an athlete forever. I've, you know, been very involved in high performance stuff. Then um, ended up doing a master's in economics, working on the floor of the board of trade. Uh, realized that was going away because, you know, I can do math in my head pretty well, but a computer is much better. Yeah. Um, So, uh, ended up switching into medical sales, which has been very fulfilling, impacting patients' lives, but, you know, the chasing your tail of chasing a number of chasing commission is, uh, really kind of started to wear on me after a number of years and got, uh, you know, bitten by the real estate investing bug. And now I split my time between, uh, medical sales and, you know, real estate investing, coaching other investors and single momming the funniest, almost five-year-old that you've ever met in your whole life. And so five, yeah, five going on probably 15, right? Oh my gosh. He's, he's hilarious. He can- well, you know, what's interesting is you, I didn't, you know, I dropped out of college three times. There's a misnomer, right? Like it's funny. I just had a conversation this morning with the guy we become a society where a highly elevated paying W-2 job, mm-hmm. whether it be 300 grand, 400 grand, 200 grand, doesn't really do anything for anybody anymore. And it's so weird to see as I grew up, and I don't know how you grew up, where that was the be end, you know, that was it when you got that position. And it's amazing the way the society has shifted so quickly. I, I grew up on a farm. You, you, I mean, you ever need to bail hay, Austin? I got you. Like, seriously, my gift for my dad every Christmas is half of a cow, you know? <laughs> so, it, I mean, it was it, the idea of earning $200,000 a year coming from the town. I, I can't, like, you, you know, this idea of if you can be it, you can see, if you can see it, you can be it thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, I didn't have a ton of examples in the world I was living in, but, you know, it's, my eyes were, you know, widely open from some travel in college and from moving far away to, you know, live by myself and play sports, you know. Where'd you travel when you were in college? Um, Well, it turned out that most of like my buds, my college teammate, my friends from college ended up playing uh, in different areas uh, in college. So I had a, a friend in New York and I, I mean, I was just so smitten by the energy of the city and, um, you know, mo- most of my travel was domestic, but still it was, you know, a far cry from, you know, the zero stoplight town, which I'm not dogging on. Like, my gosh, I, I had a conversation the other day that like the built in like 
hard work ethic yeah. and the built in, like, I can't get into any trouble because I live 10 miles from a town and you can't drive the tractor that far, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, like that, that I, I mean, I'm who I am and my ethics are my ethics largely because that's, that was built into, you know, how I grew up. But I mean, I don't know how I'm going to recreate that for my kid in the suburbs of a major city, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Well, what's interesting is, is that the same with financial education and real estate education and travel mm -hmm. and, and perspective for me is about options and lack of options, meaning not traveling doesn't give you a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And so by, by even going to New York or, or going to a Denver or going to an Austin, mm -hmm. when you're young and impressionable, you realize that there's different people out there, you know, yeah. and, people and, that don't and, look like me, people that don't have the same religion as me, people who think different thoughts and are good people, but we just have differences of opinion. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. And I grew up in the restaurant business and, you know, that's an interesting mix of uh, characters. We'll call Absolutely. them pirates, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just, for me personally, like even though uh, in my early days, I grew up in a nice area in Houston I never, you know, my parents were good people, but I never saw people as diff. Like I just, it was so much different variety of different people. Uh, you know, a lot of Hispanics. I grew up around a lot of Hispanics, and that culture to me has always intrigued me. And then I traveled to Europe, and that opened a whole different universe. But for me, that was food and, and beverage and wine, is because what I did. And so for yeah. wine, to you know, when I sold wine, it was a mystical. Um, thing to, to, to go over to France and, and like, you see these pictures and, and, and like now, like all I do, like in my real estate portfolio and building businesses too, so I can go do that forever. Right. The, the way that I put this real estate investing thing, when people are interested in, you know, trying to find a thing to get into. Well, I mean, I love real estate. I love how nimble and creative and how many cool things that you can do and how many different niches there are uh, that you can be successful in. But I, I mean, I love this real estate investing stuff because it's, it's basically I'm figuring out the money thing so mm -hmm. that I can go then live my life. Yeah. So that I'm not tied. I mean, I'm doing my day job largely now because I love it. You know, yeah. as soon as it's, you know, I don't love it anymore. I'm not going to do it anymore. And I can only make that choice because of the, you know, passive income that I've set up from my portfolio. And so uh, what, how did you find real estate? What happened? How did you get started in that? Yeah. So I, um, I remember being like my first like must be real estate investor memory was I was like 19 years old at a party in college. And I remember having a conversation with the host of that party, the girl who lived in the house. And she was explaining to me that her dad owned the house and she rented out the rooms to like our friends, her roommates. And I'm like, and you get keep that money. Oh my God. That's the best idea I've ever heard in my whole life. So that kind of bit me by the bug. And then, you know, moving to Chicago, right after undergrad master's in economics, I, I saw my dad investing in hard assets. And I was at the board of trade where guys would lose millions of dollars in an instant on paper. You know, mm -hmm. it, I, it really kind of d doubled down my interest in hard assets, did a ton of research and the analysis paralysis that I see so many people that I work with now. Um, you know, I didn't start like actually buying stuff for the express purpose of investment until 2016. And I went from, you know, just really largely starting to now I have enough to support my entire life in, you know, just under five years. So it's, 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 it's just so powerful, not, not just real estate investing, but just focus. And when you make this decision line in the sand to go pro, if that's a book you haven't read, uh, you totally should going pro. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it's a mindset. It's a decision that I'm really taking this seriously and I'm not half-assing it. Uh, once I did that, the whole world opened up. And how long was the, when you, before you enacted, how long were you studying real estate? How long was that time? I mean, I was 19. So what is that? 1999, Austin, that I became interested. 2003, I think I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, found a bunch so, of podcasts. So almost 20 years? I'm, I mean, it was in the back of my mind. It so wasn't then, a thing. Then, that what, I then what got you to get off the, the bench? Uh, my kid was born in 2016. Okay, and I had a go. legacy that I needed to build. 
I, I mean, go. that that was the linchpin of. So then, let me, and then I ask you a question, mm-hmm. put you on the spot. Okay. What would you tell Mandy at 19, that Mandy at 19, from the Mandy that knew that she was having a kid? What would you have told mm-hmm. her? I, I, a lot of it was like confidence. A lot of it was, you know, imposter syndrome stuff like the, you know, I think I, Mandy then thought it was, well, I don't belong because I'm this farm kid who doesn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not anything, you know, I'm just this little girl. Right. Mm-hmm. But the more I dig into this stuff and the more I work with people, everybody feels that way in some mm-hmm. way, you know, mm-hmm. and this, the, the Amy Cuddy research and Ted talk about, uh, imposter syndrome. It's just, it's, it's so compelling because it's, you're not alone. Anything that you realize that you're not alone in it's, I mean, you're not recreating a wheel. It's, I I mean, I feel very strongly that you do in fact need to learn as much as you can learn. But when you get to that point, you have to trust your knowledge and let go of the branch. Cause if you're just going to hold on to that branch forever, you're never going to know if you can fly. And then what then in your opinion, what gets people out of or gets them past the imposter syndrome or at least where they can deal with it? Yeah, well, uh, I'll tell you. So I see a lot in multifamily real estate investing, which is the niche that I, I play in. Um, lots of advice of, of big guys is just go buy the 400 unit, like just go do it. Like, you know, who cares? Act as if buy the, you know, it, it, money will work itself out. Well, I'm not really that person. I don't want to put at risk millions of dollars of like friends and family's money without, you know, having proven to myself, I know what I'm doing, you know? So for me, I I believe very strongly in walking before I run that this is a muscle. The first thing I did was a fourplex and then I did a sixplex. And then I, you know, I, I just built incrementally on the stuff that I was doing. And that built my muscle of, you know, number one, trusting myself, number two, courage. And then number three, a willingness to to open up what I was doing and put at risk other people's capital. Um, because I would rather mess up mine than, than theirs. Because, you know, what frustrates me in society, especially with technology, mm-hmm. is nobody's allowed to grow anymore. You can't earn the right. You can't walk the step stones. When you have a podcast and it's your first mm-hmm. podcast you ever done, the lighting better be right. The audio mm-hmm. better be right. Nobody's allowed to get better anymore. We become a, a society of nitpicking. And yeah. so so when people read these multifamily books, it's like, I'm just going to go for a hundred. Well, it's like, I, well, I got an idea. How about you buy a duplex first? Like, how about you buy a sixplex first? Like, so, and I want to provide a little color on that because I actually just gave a talk making a case for small multis on a women's group that I'm a part of. And I mean, okay, let's say you follow that path of, oh, you must do hundred units and it's fine. You'll find the money, the general partnership, the, you know, passive investors, all of that. Okay. You got a hundred doors. You found this deal. It's so good. It's perfect, right? It's an 80, 20 split with your passive investors and then the active yeah. folks. So you're part of this 20% and you're so new, but you've done an incredible job of negotiating 10% of that general partnership, right? So think this through with me, Austin, a hundred units, 20% of that is 20 doors. 10% is you own a duplex, bro. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Dude, like I, I had this conversation. I have a buddy in, in K- Kentucky and we had a joke. He was one of the second guests I ever had on the podcast. Mm-hmm. I said, let's do the math. I dropped out of college three times, but let me, let me, let me do the math. You own 50 units by yourself mm-hmm. and a buddy owns 0.00% of a thousand units. Mm, <laughs> who's making more money, but he gets right. to say he has, he gets to say he has a thousand units. Who yeah. gives a shit? Like, exactly. I, I talk about this a lot with the people that I, I work with. You know, we've got this pyramid of, you know, the things that matter in anything in life that we're doing, right? And so for investing, you kind of have to decide the things that are most important. And sure, number of doors is important. Sure, cash flow is important. Sure, you know, um, number of bedrooms is important. Whatever is important, but how you rank them changes the outcome that you're going to achieve mm-hmm. changes the type of deal you will do. So if the thing, when you get on a panel or a stage or a podcast or whatever, that you introduce yourself as, oh, I'm Manny McAllister. I have 205 doors. Well, that's not terrible. You know, uh, 130 is 
passive. Like 22 is just me. And that's the reason I can quit my job. 53 is a, a partnership. Do you know what I mean? Like if you're, if you're not honest at ground truth with what it is that you're doing, you know, the, it just made me think of something. So what? here's a new rule. When okay. you're at a convention, you have to you have to say, hi, I'm Austin Lenny. I net profit this. That's the new rule. Yes. Oh, I here's here's the thing that I'm pounding the tables on. So I joined this mastermind called Go Abundance. And one of yes, the I like, am, all my mentors are from there. Yeah. Oh, cool. So uh, mm-hmm. one of the things that they do that I, I wish would be more yes. widely adopted. One sheet. The one sheet, and more specifically in terms of this a horizontal income, this passive uh-huh. income thing. What percentage are you? So the numerator is how much passive income you bring in. The denominator is how much it costs you to live your life. How much of your life is covered by passive income? And all right, like you, so what? You've got 2,000 units. You're a four percenter, bro. Dude, have you ever felt more naked than when you have to write out your one sheet? No. Oh my gosh. And in two weeks, my go pod, like I get to be the person doing no, it. No, dude, it is. I, so I was an M1, which was the okay. group underneath yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. And all my that. mentors are from yeah. the abundance, Tim road, all, you know, mm-hmm. all those guys, Maddie, who I talked about, man, when you write out your one sheet and you have to say it in front of 30 people, I've never felt so naked in my entire life. Yeah. But it was the most realist experience because nobody talks about that stuff. And when no. you have your net worth, your your investments, your weight, your weight yes, everything. Yeah, Dude, it was crazy, man. It, it's a it was a game changer for me. Well, I mean, putting it together, like it's so there's so much raw emotion there. And you know, I had I but mean, you know why? Before I don't want to get you off of it. You want to know why? why? Because we as a society tie our identity to that number. That well, and as women, especially our weight, you know, and Mm -hmm. all of the, how connected you feel in your relationships. That's something you're supposed to push under the rug and not talk about that, you know, that type of thing is working or not working. And, you know, um, the, the group that I'm a part of, we're all really, really high achieving women and, and leaders in what it is that we do. So this chance to like open up with people who are at varying levels, you know, many very far ahead of, of where I find myself at right now, just opening up in a way that I don't have to be the one with all the answers right now. Mm -hmm. Like that is, that is also very freeing. But let me ask you a question though, because this is a very interesting conversation. Because I, I, this happens to me sometimes. When you seem to be a, a type A, you seem to have your shit together, you're, you're driving forward. Sometimes when you're always the one out front, it can mm-hmm. seem very exhausting. And so I would and, imagine and being lonely. around, and lonely, I would imagine being around these other high achieving women, you finally feel like you can like take a breath. Oh my God, you get me. Yes. Oh my God. Like all of my neighbors and my friends are like, why are you doing all of these things? Like just take a nap. You know what, I, you know what I told you know what I told him when I joined him one. Why I want to join him one. And he he said yes, you're perfect. But right after I said this, I said my dreams are bigger than the people around me. Ooh. He Ooh. goes, you're in. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I mean, the thing is, like, and you don't want to alienate the people you love, mm. you know. And that's, mm. I mean, and that statement, I get it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, said in the wrong company. Um, said in the wrong company hurtful. makes you an asshole. True yeah. story. True yeah. story. Just because it happened yesterday, I'll tell you. And, and I don't let this stuff bother me, but it's interesting. It's an interesting hum, human psychology experiment. I have uh, got sober, um, lost a ton of weight, you know, 65 pounds, two years sober. And all the people that I used to work with in the restaurant business mm-hmm. are talking shit about me. Like, oh, he has a podcast. He thinks he's a guru. Like, fuck that motherfucker. Like, these are people that I worked with for like, you know, seven years. Right. It's okay. Like I, I don't attach myself to it. They're, they're sad that their life is where it is, but it, but it, la- but it cracks me up. Right. Because no matter where you go, mm-hmm. there's always going to be distractors. If you're successful or unsuccessful or in, it's all relative. Well, you know, that that says way more about them than 100%. it does about you. I, that's why you I'm know? okay with it. Yeah. yeah. But it's, but it's interesting to me because it's a, it's a human psychology experience to understand that people. And, and so my mentor, one of my mentors, my my spirit, you call him a, my spiritual mentor, uh, Mr. Brad Johnson, who is the most amazing human I've ever met. He said, Austin, when you can walk around this universe and you can mm-hmm. look at every soul and know that somebody, everybody's hurting from something, yeah, and you can have compassion in your heart. And I yeah. do. 
And that's why yeah. I'm okay with it. Mm-hmm. You it's never know what somebody's dealing with, for sure. You never know what they've been through and you never know what they're dealing with. And mm-hmm. so when you can open up and give them space yeah. to, to not judge. And so the number one quality that people tell mm-hmm. me about me is that there's no judgment from me. Yeah. And I'm like, no, because I've probably done it worse. My, my <laughs> early 20s was way worse. And so all I want you to do is just be the best version of yourself. And yeah. so there's no expectations. Yeah, there's no there's no anything, right? And so I'm curious because as you're speaking to me and we're having this conversation, you you feel so, it feels so good and clear and natural. But I don't think this was always the case uh-uh. with you. Yeah, no. that's what I was I, gonna I, ask. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like anybody who's gone through some shit, like that's, that's like the, you know, those are the interesting people. Those, mm-hmm. and, and that what you said about judgment, I mean, the, I mean, that's how you know friendships. That's how you know, like, that's what real love is, really. To, the mm-hmm. most loving thing you can do is when somebody screwed up, like to sit with them in their hurt without mm-hmm. judgment, you know? Mm-hmm. And I actually, so I, I have this women's group, Aspiring Women Achieving More. It's really just mm-hmm. motivation for, for women. We have a quote today that um, I post them a month in advance. So it's always sure. a little surprise for me. When yeah. I, Anyway, the one that appeared today was if doubt, if people are doubting how far you can go, go so far that you can't hear them anymore. Mm-hmm. So that is 100% what you were talking about. I love it. It's yeah. the truth because what I tell my team all the time, and it's, it's kind of a reference point. I use a lot of things to just reference point things to get them to mm-hmm. like wrap their head around it. I say, if you can wake up every day and know that Gary V says he's playing small, then we got shit to do. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and what I'm saying to them is not like try harder. I'm saying to them, like, you're better than this. You're, yeah. you're, you're with me. We're yeah. on this journey and, and there's no ceiling. There's no ceiling. And, and one you, of, go ahead. you are the, your only competition, you you're, know, it's it. It's it. And as my, my favorite quote, Matty A says, is he says, make your ceiling your new floor. Mm. And so we portray that there's these ceilings, there's these limitations on us. And really there isn't, but here's the kicker is you have to know what success or what a good life looks like to you before you even go chase. Yeah. That's the case. And and that's right back to, if you can't see it, you can't be it. You know, mm-hmm. it's that athlete, there's tons of like social science data on, you know, studying athletes and the visualization of things. And I mean, it's like the secret stuff, you know, like the, the, I mean, I, Mandy five years ago, wouldn't have bought into the woo woo <laughs> stuff of visualization, I to, but like, I try to keep it. No, I go there sometimes, but we try to, you know, it's well, like, right. But I mean, yeah. there's, there's such power to it. Like I, our shared friend, uh, Barry Griffiths and I mm-hmm. do uh, a mindset series on his podcast. And we just talked about vision boards because I, I have a, um, with my nanny, we made vision boards cause it's the thing she wanted to do. And I wanted to support her. So we did it and I put it in my closet and I didn't look at it for six months and mm-hmm. freaking a Austin. If like half of the things on that vision board that I made didn't come true in six months, months without looking at it. It's really just, you know, it's your reticular activating system. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for? You just bought a new car. Oh, weird. You're seeing that car everywhere now, you know? Well, and what's interesting is I don't, here's the kicker. I don't think enough people get really granular with it. Like when you tell me you want a car, is it orange? Is the Mm -hmm. leather black? Like, Mm -hmm. let's make it like, no, I don't want to like Ed, my let said, no, I didn't say I want to live in a certain area. I want to live right there. And then sure that enough, you live there. And so mm-hmm. we have to ask ourselves, but more importantly, and here's the, here's the re- interesting thing. You have to have clarity on who you are as a person. Make Perfect. sure that you're living your true vision, because mm-hmm. I believe that most people's goals and things that they want are triggered by a false narrative. And so they're building life and goals on false BS. Preach. Yes. Yes. I mean, if you, and and I think that was a big part of, you know, things that I figured out for myself, right? Mm -hmm. Like I was supposed to have been a doctor and I chose not to go to medical school. I was, I mean, I, I, I I followed this script of the things I was supposed to be. And it wasn't until you start peeling off those things that, well, is this my choice or is this an expectation that's Mm -hmm. been put on me? Mm -hmm. You know? And I, it's just, I mean, it, it feels also very weird to think that uh, 
all of this cool stuff that I've been able to pull off in my, you know, life to date, like a lot of it was because of expectations, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm not mad at it. Like I can't be mad at it, but how, but it was incredibly freeing the moment I realized that, oh shit, I get to pick. Like, mm -hmm. do you, do you realize that? Like I mm -hmm. get to pick how I spend my days, how sure. I spend, you know, wh who I am around the, the, the work that I do mm -hmm. until you get really true on separating your choice from your expectation. You're never really going to understand who you are. And that is step number one in anything that you're doing. Well, have you, do you know who Kyle ceases or not? So do you know who that is? Oh, sorry. Uh, broke up. Say it again. Kyle Cease. Do you know who Kyle Cease is? No. So he's not. one of my favorite personal development guys. He, the best interview I've ever seen Tom Ballou and him on impact theory. He never plans anything. Okay. He's my guy. Everything's off the cuff. And he says that he believes that nobody's ever broke your heart. He said, what they've done is they've broken your expectations. And by breaking your expectations, yes. they got closer to your heart. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I mean, expectations are and everything. The, I just had mine. I just had is everything. I, I just had my expectations get driven into a, a, a tree doing about 200 miles an hour last week on a deal we were working on. And we did a podcast mm. about it because on my other podcast and we wanted I, I did it raw and I did everything because I wanted to show people that you I'm trying to adopt this stoic mindset, like neutral thinking, because I get like, one of my faults is I'm wear my heart on my sleeve, which is not my fault, mm -hmm. but it's one of the things that hurts me too. I like that I live that way, but it also is what's got me in a lot of trouble too. And so, you know, Opens just trying to protect. To, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword because it also allows me to connect with people. So it's an mm -hmm. interesting thing because there's been so many real estate deals for me that I've already, cause I'm a bit, I'm a, I'm a visionary, right? So like, I'm already thinking about, we're going to do this and that. And you know how real estate goes. It, sometimes it doesn't go that way. <laughs> so you might just right. want to close the deal. The tea, but... Yeah. You might just want to close the deal. And so as you build up, how many properties do you have now under your portfolio units? My, my portfolio that's mine is, is uh, 22. I have two partners on a 53 unit. And okay. then, you know, I'm part of a syndication of 130. So all in 205. So it's it's not that there's not women in multifamily. It's not that there's not women in investing. Mm -hmm. There are. I've met them. They're amazing. But why do you think a lot of, like, I, there's not more? Is that something that y'all address mm -hmm. in your in your group? And, and yeah. Yeah. Well, I absolutely. And I, I mean, I've done a couple of talks on it. Actually, there's a... Um, I, I think end of the day, if I had to only name like one or two things, um, all of the guidance out there is go buy that 400 unit property. You know what I mean? And it takes a certain level of bravado to jump into in that way, you know? And I would say, you know, not knocking your boys out there, but like largely uh, men have a better developed sense of bravado than women do because yeah. we, you know, if you, if you look at high performing women, especially, we tend to have been incredible rule followers and we were perfect and we raised our hand and we got straight A's and we did everything that was expected of us. And I mean, even to dip your toes into real estate investing, it's kind of like a counterculture. You know, it's a different way of looking at the world that you're going to figure out this money stuff and then go live your life rather than have this super high paying W2 or like, you know, be a stay at home mom or all of these things that you maybe should have been in your script. You know, so number one, it being in, you know, especially commercial real estate or real estate investing in general, it's it's outside of that normal path. Mm -hmm. Right. And then secondly, you know, women do tend to want to prove things to themselves. I think imposter syndrome affects women in a higher proportion than men. And mm -hmm. to take a jump into a $4 million property feels, you know, it's scary, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we have a group that we run um, through One Life Fully Lived. Uh, it was our second call last night, like recovery mastermind group. And I asked mm -hmm. everybody that's in there that, they don't know much about real estate. And I said, true or false, 
I was like, you need to have money to invest in real estate. Mm -hmm. And all of them were like, true. And I'm like, no, you need to have somebody's money. Doesn't need to be your money. Mm -hmm. And so as I personally believe that I'd always like to have women in my business because they keep the uh, company sane because (laughs) us us men in our egos can get us in, in a lot of trouble, you know? And I think as you look at investing on a whole, it's, It can be methodically done Mm -hmm. over time to gain um, levels. But like you said, the thing that we keep talking about is everybody says, no, you can't do it this way. Right. You've got to go out there. And I'm like, you don't got to do anything. Yeah. As you said, life's a choice. Yes. Well, and I mean, what has really, you know, I I kept fours and sixes and eights felt very comfortable to me Mm -hmm. for like the first call it three, four years of this journey. And actually just in September, um, my two partners and I closed on the 53 unit, which was the biggest that I I've kind of been at the helm for. And I mean, what I think took me over the edge there was I, I couldn't get comfortable with like this idea of just going after this one end must be a hundred units, must be that heavy value add must be business plan of three or five years. Like, I didn't think that that worked in the climate that we're in right now. And the realization that like, oh my gosh, we can target something that's a stabilized asset. So number one, nobody's really looking at stabilized assets rather than value add. Mm-hmm. Number two, we, we looked at, you know, smaller than a hundred units, 53, right. But we still get the, the market that we love and the, you know, the really great debt that, you know, we locked in for 15 years and have eight years of interest only. So the, what gives me a ton of comfort and it's actually kind of a stoic philosophy type of thinking is, you know, how can I get comfortable with the downside and how can I think of, you know, uh, whatever a potential thing that could go wrong and think that through in a more planned out way that I, I I know how to address it when I get there. So worst case scenario was, you know, we had a, we could have economic vacancy of 42% on this 53 unit. Like mm-hmm. we ran those numbers and still be able to pay our bills. Well, in the middle of COVID, you know, people that were losing their jobs were like bartenders and, um, you know, uh, manicurists, people who had jobs that largely didn't require college education. The people who were computer programmers or high-end sales reps or nurses, they had their jobs largely still. So, you know, we just did kind of, I, I got all the applications from, um, uh, for, you know, being able to live in that property from the previous property manager and just saw that, oh my gosh, only 20 of them have these at-risk type jobs. So, you know, I got comfortable with the downside and we jumped in. So, wow, I never would have, you just, you just blew me away with that. I would have never thought to go through the applications and look at what their jobs were. But I mean, end of the day, like we, I, so I ended up studying economics for my master's and like, that's, that's like, you, you can really get granular. It's, I, I mean, I feel like that's the thing that I say all the time in my coaching groups and stuff that if, if you get very specific, very down into the dirty of mm-hmm. what it is that you, you know, are going for and any problem, I think this is a big one. Um, any problem that you've got, if you can really quantify it in a very precise way, it is so much like so much less scary. There was a woman that joins our accountability group on Fridays that she's like, I want to quit my job, but I need the healthcare. I'm like, well, have you ever priced it out? Like, do you know what you, how much it would cost you to get healthcare with, with like not with your employer? And the next week she shows up, she's like, maybe it was $500. I'm like, so your fear that was keeping you from the life you want to live was $500. Dude, my favorite thing is, uh, when they tell me like, I really want to invest in real estate and uh, I can't afford a house. And I'm like, well, have you talked to a mortgage broker? Mm-hmm. No, we've been waiting for like a year. I'm like, well, you have no idea. You, you don't, don't know, know until you know, you have to ask these questions, you know, and another, okay. I, I have one other question in this whole real estate investing game is everybody says, oh, I want to quit my W-2. Well, I want financial freedom. Well, what the hell does that mean? You know, Mm -hmm. there's no real quantifying of that problem because people go chase these 400 units or 100 units and then 20% and 10% and end up owning a duplex and don't really achieve what it is that they're going for. So I made a little calculator, just a a spreadsheet to help people really estimate what is it that you need, you Mm -hmm. know? And Mm -hmm. if you exactly, you know, where do you want to go? If you, if, if you want to drive, from, you know, Chicago to LA, 
then great. You just punch it in the GPS, you know, the next right step, yeah. right? But mm-hmm. if you want to go to New York, it's a def- it's a different next right step. You just got to figure out your, you know, North star of where you want to go. And then you figure out the next right step. No, I love that. And so what would your be advice be to anybody that's listening that is a single mom, does have a W-2, wants to invest? You know, how do you juggle it all? How do you, how do you get it all done? Yeah, I, um, we, we talked about this a little bit offline, but this, this concept of being ruthlessly protective of my time. And what helps, and I'm not perfect at it. I am, a, I am big time a work in progress on this. Um, what I will say is I switched day jobs so that I could have more control of my time um, so that I could really do time blocking and execute it in a big way. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the first thing is, so I'm um, a, a woman I am coaching who's a single mom. You know, we we with the less bandwidth really do have to get very careful and intentional about how we're spending that time. So really being very clear, as absolutely clear as you can be on what that next right step is and being prepared to work on that next right step the minute you have some freedom. So um, I, you know, for instance, I I drive a lot for my my work. So I'll yell at my phone like, hey, Siri, put Austin Linney on my follow-up list. She's going to talk to me now. But um, so when I have this time that I can dedicate to, you know, my side hustle, I know exactly where to go. I'm not spending a half hour trying to figure out what I should be doing. I am yeah. prepared, mm-hmm. you know? Well, what's interesting is I have a friend who runs uh, a ton of money for UT. He's a trader for mm-hmm. like 5 billion um, for them. They have, they have 50 billion. So it's really, that's nothing, but uh he's very into like Iron Man's and everything. And so we met before the start of the year. And I was like, you know, I'm a little bit, last year was nuts for me. Uh, I'm a little bit of a doer. Like I just dive in and then Same. like, but like I, this whole year for me is about metrics. And so we went in and I scheduled out my audible books that I'm listening to for the entire year. Love so it. I don't have to waste 30 minutes or a day trying to find the next book. I know mm-hmm. exactly where I'm going. Same thing with the training. And mm-hmm. man, I tell you what, because I think in society, what we're dealing with right now is two things. This is kind of stuff that people don't talk about. I think we have decision overload. And yes. I think I think we don't plan enough that people don't understand that you have more beta waves in your brain in the morning. And so mm-hmm. as the day goes on, your skills for picking and being disciplined go out the window. Mm-hmm. So for me, I try to be done with big, like big coaching stuff by four mm-hmm. o'clock in the afternoon. Like, I don't want to make decisions, hard decisions after four o'clock yeah. because my strength is not as strong. Well, I read a book called Scarcity that, mm-hmm. um, you know, you th- economic sort of scarcity, you think scarcity of money, scarcity of time. But the thing I didn't think about that they really dived into the, the social science of is scarcity of bandwidth. And mm-hmm. what you're saying is is proven and true because like they, they did a study that like they have people were doing cognitive problems and they were all dieters, right? Well, the dieters who were doing these cognitive problems with the bowl of candy next to the computer Mm -hmm. did way less well than the people who did it with that candy across the room because all of their bandwidth was going to not eating that damn candy, Mm -hmm. you know? So setting yourself up for success is is huge. Well, here's the deal. We as people, and I used to know this when when I was drinking a lot, we like to put obstacles in our way because we we get off on the discomfort of like uh, putting booby traps in our way, and but so there's a reward there, yeah, right? Yeah, like there, there's. I mean, booze does a lot of things, right? Like it's uh, <laughs> number one, it's a reason that I couldn't do X, Y, Z. So yeah. I'm not really letting myself down. It's that there you go. It's almost there's sad. The, yeah. the stress release, right? Like there's that deep breath. It's you more know? of what the drink tells you than what the actual drink is doing. Yeah. And see what people don't talk about. These are weird things that people don't talk about when you talk about not drinking anymore. I had to retrain myself how to celebrate. Ooh. Yeah. Like, talk about something that you never would have thought about in your entire life. So then you close on a deal and you're like, well, that's the only way I would go have drinks. Yeah. What, what do you do? do? And dude, screw that. That even worse than that was going on vacation and not drinking. I know. Yeah. That was insane. When I went to Costa Rica for 10 days and didn't drink, that was like, it turned the whole corner for me. When I got through that trip, I was like, okay, I'm good. I can do this. 
What do yeah. you do instead to celebrate? Uh, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't get this out. Uh, <laughs> so I've created this thing where anytime I close something or something happens, I listen to 24 K magic by Bruno Mars. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. My, my five-year-old loves it too. There you go. Okay. Me and my five, yeah. you're a five-year-old. We could get down, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's, what's interesting. It's the truth. Think about it. The moment that you go out of the country or you go to Mexico and you step foot, what does your mm. first mind say? I have a cocktail. We're going to do yeah. this. And so yeah. now you go hang out with friends. I'm going to have a cocktail. And it's yeah. amazing how many things are associated with having a drink. Well, I did sober January. Like we did okay. a sober January challenge through um, aspiring women. And I mean, I'm a single mama. I went on some first dates and I'm like, I'm not drinking. Right. And <laughs> boys canceled on me, Austin. I will. No way. way. Yeah, I know. Seriously. I'm like, uh, I, excuse yeah. me. Do you know who I am? Uh, excuse me. I buy apartments. Do you know who I am? <laughs> but I mean, well, no, because he, we couldn't have a drink, whatever. But anyway, no. like, I mean, but I feel like, wow, what a cool hack, like yeah. to see who's like reliant. You on... know what's interesting with people in, and, and I shouldn't let this out, but I've, I've be, I, I like to study people and, and, I, and, and cause I'm guilty of it. A lot of the times I'll set traps out for people to see how they react because by setting that trap and then reacting a certain way, I see what the real intentions are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, just take a note, this, this observer of humanity, mm -hmm. I mean, the being able to pick up and on empathetically what's going on in, in anybody's reaction of anything, this emotional intelligence thing is, is really, you know, you know, the eighties and the nineties brought us this just work more mm -hmm. and that's how you're going to find success mm -hmm. where we're at now with technology. And it's, it's really, you know, being able to do this deep work and really being able to do this connection and, and really show up in a way that is truthful and authentic, mm -hmm. like you're saying is, is really the primary currency I feel of what success drivers are in mm -hmm. this century. Wait, now I think ultimately there was a very interesting podcast with Seth Godin and Aubrey Marcus, and they were talking mm -hmm. about how the contract work sector I is mean, gaining yeah. like so much and mm -hmm. end over end. And, and what they're saying is like, we were talking about this last night on our group call. If you have a skill, you no longer have to be in said city yep. to make money from your skill. And then you get back half your time. And so I think we need to like, disband the bs of like it's not possible everything is possible it's just how bad do you want it exactly and, and and once you once you get clear on what you want it's funny i do this trick with all my young kids that i coach because they'll have like a regular job and they're like hey i want to quit this job so i can focus on real estate and i'm like okay how much neat. you make a year neat and they're like well after taxes i make like twenty seven thousand. i was like okay so let me do the math for you if you went out on January 1st and by January 15th, you had two wholesale deals that, that did 27 K you could leave your job for the year and they go, fuck. <laughs> right. Go, because you haven't put it down on paper. You don't realize how it's the easy making it is. that problem granular. I, we got to put this calculator in the, in the show notes, because yes. once you can figure that stuff out, it's getting your hands around, mm -hmm. you know, what do I spend? What do I make that figuring that out? And if you're, if you're older than like 22, making $27,000 after taxes, you know, yeah. a little bit more difficult to figure out, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, man, it's, but, but what's I, interesting I, is, is as I think financial freedom, the definition of it needs to change. This mm -hmm. is the way I view it. Put yourself in a position to have passive income coming in to get you neutral. Yeah. So when you're neutral and you're free, you can make the actual decision for the rest of your life. Exactly. Figure out the money and then go live your life. Yes, because it's not like any of us want financial freedom to go sit on the beach. I would be done after a day. Like, yeah. I don't I don't like that. I like to work, but I yeah. want to be able to make my choices. Like yeah. Aubrey Marcus was saying, he said, you could make a choice not to eat mm -hmm. and you would die but that's still your choice. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, when you think of it that way, everything is a choice. And so, you know, I want to wrap this up. How do people find out about your group? How do they find out about you? Yeah. So the, the catch all for all the stuff I'm involved in my um, investing arm, uh, good fortune capital. We do syndications. I do coaching aspiring women, achieving more as a, as a women empowerment group. Best place to find all of that information is on mandymcallister.com. 
I will tell you this. I knew this was going to be this way, but you are, you're so well-spoken. You're so put together. It's, it's quite impressive. Uh, I'm really glad that Barry introduced us and yeah. uh, you're still in Chicago. I am. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I don't get up that way that often, but we are <laughs> talking about uh, doing something in, in Minnesota maybe. So, okay. Uh, so nearish, uh, but May 14th and 15th, we're doing a massive uh, free uh, mastermind in Nashville. Um, oh, bunch of big Nashville. syndicators. All the guys from Jake and Gino are coming up. Um, mm. Bruce Peterson, Tyler Coble, Elvin Holiday. All the big guys are speaking. Count uh, me some in. Dudes from bigger pockets. So it's going to be a good weekend. So literally, when we get off here, I'm going to like request kid coverage. So there that you I get go. To kid come. coverage. Yeah. Come have fun. <laughs> We're going to do it great, guys. Uh, if you like this episode, make sure you send it out to your friends, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.